Hey, I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And you're listening to fiction or nonfiction. Cue music. Hey, so this is the program where we go through stories, news articles, and viral tales, and we try to determine the truth of them, if they are true or false, if they are fiction, or... Not fiction. It, well, that too. Non-fiction. Yeah. Non-fiction, that's right. So I'm I forgot Adam. the name of the show. Well, Dave, that's not true. You okay, were just what's your name? T- oh my, I'm going to throw a, a battery at you. <laughs> no, I don't, we, non-violence here on fiction or non-fiction, although I may not be able to say that for the tale I'm going to share with you. Uh, you know, I like bringing some of the weird urban legends to our show because I find urban legends very fascinating. Oh, you do? I, I do. Um, okay. I don't know. What do you think it is about urban legends that just causes them to stay around so much in the popular imagination? Well, I think they're kind of, whether or not they're new or old, they're kind of like folk tales. They've been told. They've been changed. And they're things that have just been around. Like, they're, sometimes they're there just to scare you. Sometimes they're there just to be an interesting fact relating to history. Who knows? And I think also they kind of impart a certain morality or certain lessons, or at least they're trying to get those across in these stories. Yeah, like they're, the hand to the hook thing. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because guess what we're talking about? The oh. tale of the hook. Really? For real? For real. By the way, everyone, I had no idea he was going to talk about this one. Well, okay. Serendipity. I love that. So, Dave. Hot dog. Well, no, it's a hook. Okay. Okay, I could give the legend, but I'm kind of curious for you to give uh, just your own version, like uh, Cole's Notes version. What is the tale of the hook? You shouldn't ask me because it's going to be not good. Okay, so anyways, uh, there's these people and like they're like, yeah, they're like, you know. Smooching. Yeah. They're They're smooching in a car. Okay, let me start again. So there's these two people. They're at makeout points. It's nighttime. They're doing the makeout things. And, uh, you know, it's getting hot and heavy, and then all of a sudden, you hear some creepy sounds, okay? And one, the other person tells the other person, we're not going to give them names because why? Uh, they tell them that there is a killer around, and this killer has a hook hand, and that's how you know that you're next, because the hook hand's coming for you. I'm probably screwing this story up, by the no, way. No, yeah, this is actually very accurate so far. Okay. Go on. And then what happens is, like, you know, they try, he tries to scare his partner, and they're like, ah, whatever, but it's, there's nothing. Nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, the hook hand comes, and someone dies. End of story. Is that what happens? That's kind of it, actually. And there's, there's different tellings of it. The, the one I'm familiar with is, is very similar. This is usually set sometimes within the 1940s or 1950s, yeah. or teen makeout corners and, you know, lover's lane sort of situations anyway yeah two teens are together they're smooching inside a car uh there's either a news report or one of the partners shares a story about how there's a report of a serial killer on the loose with a hook hand okay they keep smooching and then the car rocks there's some sort of motion or loud sound outside the partner who was told the story is freaked out and says no get us out of here i can't stay here any longer and so the view begrudgingly drives the partner home, and when they leave to go inside their house, they turn around and scream. The driver runs out and looks, and there is a hook left on the handle of their partner's door. Oh. So yeah, there's different variations of it. My, the, I was trying to be brief, but my story was not as good as yours. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I, I don't think that's true at all, Dave, but uh, I think we did commendable recountings of the tale of the hook, and of course there are endless, so. endless uh, iterations of it. We could make it more dramatic. We could uh, make it longer. But you know what? Let's continue with what you're talking about. Yeah. So, you know, this is a very popular story that has been passed on through generation through generation. My question, Dave, is this infamous story based on true events? I'm going to say yes. Okay. If we want to determine that this is indeed a nonfiction or a fiction story, we're going to have to delve into it a little bit more. So what would be your first step trying to unearth the truthiness of well, the story? Well, you got to try and find when was the first instance that this was used. And for something like this, not that it's not a story, 
it might have just been something people were saying. So you just have to try and delve back into what is the first known instance of this story? Very good. You can hear the crumpling of paper as I open up my manila folder. Uh, so I have evidence here. And okay. I'm going to love to share this okay. because I do agree with you. I think the first place we need to go to is the initial recorded instance of this story, the first written account of it. Now, I know you love multiple choice questions, Dave. Are you going to give me multiple choice questions? I'm going to give you multiple choice. I'm ready. So the first I did time, poorly on them in school, but I'll do good here. We'll see. I'll do well. Well, you have a one in three chance. Okay. Uh, so when was this story first released and recorded? Okay. Was it in 1955, uh -huh. 1960, mm -hmm. or 1970? Ooh. See, I want to say 55. I, I think that's wrong, but I want to say I'm going to go with 1955. Final answer, I have no more lifelines. Well, I think by, uh, if we're on game show logic, I think by prices right rules, you, you are okay because uh, it is 1960, actually, so uh, just five years off. Should have used the phone a friend. You should have. Uh, there's no phone in this room. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> okay, th this is interesting, though, because obviously we're so used to hearing this story set sometime in the late 40s, 1950s. Uh, so already I'm a little bit curious why this was only first published and in print in 1960. Do you want to take a stab in the dark, though, where it was first printed? I'm going to guess it was in some sort of like horror magazine type thing. Comic book, maybe. You are going to be shocked, I'm sure. Okay. The November 8th, 1960 edition of Dear Abby. What? Oh, it was like a newspaper answer column? Thing? Exactly. So Dear Abby was a very popular advice newspaper column where, you know, people would write in to Abby to get advice about her. Uh, romantic relationships, to get general life advice. I'm going to read you the full article. Oh, please do. Dear Abby, if you are interested in teenagers, you will print this story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it doesn't matter because it served its purpose for me. A fellow and his date pulled into their favorite lover's lane to listen to the radio and to do a little necking. The music was interrupted by an announcer who said there was an escaped convict in the area who had served time for rape and robbery. He was described as having a hook instead of a right hand. The couple became frightened and drove away. When the boy took his girl home, he went around to open the car door for her. Then he saw a hook on the door handle. I will never park to make out as long as I live. I hope this does the same for other kids. Signed, Jeanette. Oh, and what did Abby say to Jeanette? I don't have that. Oh. I mean, I don't know what advice you can give. So, do, do you think maybe it was like a thing people were saying to kind of scare teenagers to not do that sort of thing? Well, certainly this is interesting because even in this article, this, this little essay written by the Jeanette, and who knows what Jeanette's actual name was. It could have been could have been Jean. It could have been Jennifer. It could have been something without a J. Exactly. Uh, uh, the possibilities are endless within the alphabet. But uh, yeah, it even says here, I will never park to make out as long as I live. I hope this does the same for other kids. So obviously, this is put out there with an agenda. This person is outright saying, I hope this prevents teenagers from going and making out. And we have to go back in time and contextualize that in the 1950s, I don't want to say exactly a social taboo, but it was something that was admonished by the older generation. You just simply didn't find a girl or a guy or whomever at your high school and just start making out with them. The shifting social mores at the time in North America uh, made a lot of the older generation very uncomfortable. Yeah. So certainly, urban legends and cautionary tales are often used as a way to uh, basically get people to behave in ways that mainstream culture wants them to. Mm -hmm. This doesn't necessarily refute the story. Okay. But, but based off of this, uh, I'm curious at this point, you wanted to say it was true. You wanted to say this was a nonfiction story. What's your stance right now? It's probably not. It's probably something someone made up. Okay. Well, we have the first recorded instance and everything else apparently before that was word of mouth. Okay. Now, going back into records, 
there have been attempts to try to unearth is there any similar attacks of a hook handed serial killer okay um there hasn't been a lot exposed but the origins of this legend were actually unpacked a bit by a folklorist and historian named Jan Harold Brunvand. According to a book that he wrote, The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings, the story really spread and became widespread by 1959, so right at the death knoll of the 1950s, while it did expand into the 1960s, and probably was popularized by that Dear Abby letter. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two things that have been debunked about this myth. Okay. So what do you think they are? There's no name of the person. Well, and that's certainly one thing. Like, we're hearing accounts of a guy and a girl, two partners in a car, of a suspected serial killer. We don't have any actual names. For anyone, the people or the suspected killer, there's no name. Or the community. So, you know, that is something, the lack of detail about it, because there's no detail even really about what community it took place in. But the other thing that gave a lot of people suspicion that this was not true was the news broadcast. Oh, yes. Okay. They went through records of what bulletins would go through news stations, and there was no evidence, no recorded instance of any broadcaster indicating there was ever a bulletin about a hook-handed killer. Well, that's a, that's a good way to refute it. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean it may not have been lost in time, but certainly there's no evidence to support it. Okay. So we don't really know. Well, we don't 100% know, but I think it's very safe to lean on the side of legend and to say this is probably fiction. And uh, I'm going to reference another great resource you can use if you want to fact check stories and get accurate information on whether something is fact or fiction, whether it's true or not true, which is Snopes. Snopes is a news organization that will actually go through stories and reputed truths, so they are a fact-checking organization. Okay. So according to a Snopes writer named David Mickelson, he has a suspicion that the legend might have roots in real-life Lovers Lane's murders, because there have been serial killings of people who were at these lover lanes or these makeout corners dating as far back as the 1940s. And there's a very infamous one in 1946, the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. Okay. So does, do you know anything about this? I don't. No, I don't. I'm going to quote Mickelson directly from his article because I think this is very illuminating. It's possible the roots of legends like The Hook lie in distorted memories there were actual cases of kids who'd gone necking, coming back in pine boxes. The residue of these news stories about these events would likely remain around for a while, mutating into cautionary tales with the addition of bloody hooks and scraping sounds on the roof of a car. So what he's basically saying is there were certainly similar stories that influenced it, but not a direct incident. Okay. Now, the Texarkana Moonlight Murders were very infamous. They happened in Bowie County, Texas, uh, and also in Miller County, Arkansas. Uh, this took place in 1946. Over a 10-week period, there were eight victims that were shot by a perpetrator. Uh, of the eight victims, five perished. Five of the attacks were fatal. And the perpetrator remained unidentified and to this day was never revealed. They have been given the alias the Phantom Killer because no one was able to find any information on them. Wow. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I guess this is an instance where we can say this particular tale may have root in real life tragedies about the killings of these teenagers going to lover lanes. But uh, in terms of the actual story of the hook handed perpetrator, there is no records according to major American uh, news broadcasters, about an emergency bulletin. Uh, no records of that with a hook-handed individual. No public records showing an escaped convict with a hook hand. The urban legend remains an urban legend. So aside from the fact that there were indeed some grisly tragic killings of teens making out, the actual story of the hook? Based on... Ba yeah, it, remi it remains based on... Slightly based on true events, but... Primarily, fiction. 
<laughs> you know what it's time for? Oh, oh. Let's see, tell me, tell me what it's time for. I, is it time to unleash the hook? No. Okay, is it time for a random Dave question slash fact? It is. Oh, oh joy. So you know what mine is this time? Is it about hooks? It is not about hooks. Oh, okay. It's about, yes, you guessed it, fluorescent lighting. Of course, they go so hand in hand. Okay. Uh, No pun intended, sorry. (laughs) I'm going to tell you something, and you're going to tell me if it's fact or fiction. And then I'll give you a little bit of history, brief history, on this random fact. That's the way I like it. So... Fluorescent lighting or fluorescent lamps were invented by Thomas Edison. Yes, that's true. That is not true. Oh. That is fiction. Okay, now you made me give up on Edison last episode. This one, you're doing it again. <laughs> now, here's the, here's the issue with this. There is, it's a bit conflicted, this story, because there's evidence that it could be one, it could be Edison, but there's also evidence that it could be someone else. Hmm. So, of course, fluorescent lighting, for people who don't know, uh, you know, instead of a regular light bulb, you know, which has, like, tungsten and stuff in it that creates light, fluorescent light uses, like, a mercury vapor gas, and it creates, it produces light. Which is also why you should not break it. Do not break those bulbs. Don't break them. Don't drink the liquid. No. Um, no matter how glowy it is inside. Very uh, tempting, but so still. So it's credited to a German inventor named Edmund Germer. Um, he's recognized as the father of the, of the fluorescent lamp. He got a doctorate from the University of Berlin in lighting technology, mm. and he applied for a patent for the fluorescent lamp with two other uh, inventors, Frederick Mayer and Hans J. Spanner, on December 10th, 1926. 1926, okay. Okay. Now, the patent was later purchased by the General Electric Company, and they developed it a little further. This is where it gets a little bit conflicting because most places will say Edmund Germer, yes, but Thomas Edison has a fluorescent lamp patent, and it's one of his lesser-known patents. As If you don't know who Thomas Edison is, he invented a lot of stuff. And, you know, honestly, just as a little side note, if you do want more information on Thomas Edison, go to our website, WindsorPublicLibrary.com, and go to our eDatabases tab where you can look up articles that describe his life and give a very thorough list of the inventions that he helped helm. So ha- just yeah. a little side note there. And we have books on Edison and, and a lot of this stuff we're talking about. What I want to say is there was a patent that it's a lesser known patent that, that um, Edison applied for. Okay. Was it edibulbs? No, it was granted on September 10th, 1907 for a fluorescent lamp. Ooh. This application was initially filed in May of 1896 and renewed in 1902, and then it was granted in 1907. Now, I got this information from a resource I used earlier, the National Museum of American History. Now, most places are going to tell you that Germer invented it, and you know what? That is what people are led to believe. Now, there's, I don't, it gets a little c- confusing well, here because Edison well, invented wait, does so that much. that mean I was right when I said Edison? Because he has the earliest track record. I didn't ask who had the first patent. I invented who's, who invented. Well, maybe well, I mean, you're right. Yeah, I don't why, know. Why would he have a patent if he didn't invent it? I don't know. Uh, you know, this is interesting, too, because, you know, we are going through a, a museum archive that is giving this information, but it's backed up by sources outside of the museum. Um, definitely, there is kind of a love of Thomas Edison in America as being like the archetypal basement inventor. But I think that's true. Also, you know, Edmund was a German inventor, mm-hmm. um, and then Edison obviously was American. And this is coming from the National Museum of American History, which makes me wonder if there's a little bit of nationalist stake. Here. Maybe, but there's a conflict, I guess, of of interest, I suppose. But there's a lot of resources that say it's Germer. Oh, we should mention the light bulb was invented by Thomas Edison. That's not true. Yes, it is. So anyways. That, that's what I said, but it's not what I really believed inside. So Dave, we're going through this and there's, okay, there's a lot of contention who actually invented the fluorescent light bulb. So I see you have a stack of books over there. We can hear you rustling paper. Yes. Now, with a lot of early inventions, it's, it gets a little bit convoluted, uh, but fluorescent lighting uh, we've talked about already, but according to this book, uh, I pulled this book. It's called Inventions and Inventors, uh, McGill's Choice. It's like an encyclopedia. Um, this one's from 2015, but I did check some places online, and they all seem to have 
similar um, answers. So basically, fluorescent lighting, it goes back a long ways. Um, the people behind the invention go all the way back to the 1600s, starting with Vincenzo Cascacariolo, an Italian alchemist, and shoemaker Henrik Geisler, German glass blower, who we mentioned briefly, mm -hmm. and Peter Cooper Hewitt, uh, American electrical engineer. But uh, there's an, it's referenced in here, there's a New York Times article. They summarize the commercial development of this fluorescent light because apparently Edison and even Nikolai Tesla experimented with fluorescent lighting, um, but they didn't make it available commercially. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps it just was not seen as viable at the time. Yes, and, and Edison did get a patent, but mm -hmm. he was still kind of experimenting with it. Um, but according to New York Times, there's 12 inventors present for this invention. Thomas Edison, Robert Fulton, Charles Goodyear, Charles Hall, Elias Howe, Cyrus Hall McCormick. <laughs> should, should I say all these names? Well, I guess you don't have to. Okay. I mean, you have the big ones, and there's more. So I, I think this is interesting because, to me, uh, we like very quick, very succinct answers saying who invented X product well, it was this individual. This one isn't as easy. Is it isn't as easy to say? No, and history is much trickier than that. In fact, oftentimes the development of technology comes with many hands coming into play, as with this. Now, you brought up Geisler, and Geisler was interesting because he was the one that developed the tube, the casing. Yes. Oh. Yeah, he is a glass blower or glass maker. He developed like a vacuum pump. Basically, th there's a gas in fluorescent lighting and it contains mercury which causes some issues they have to be recycled a certain way basically the whole point of the fluorescent lighting is it changed the way people can light stuff it became more efficient for uh, businesses people in homes but mostly these big businesses most places you go public places you're going to look up and see fluorescent lighting now of course it's changed now they have new newer led lighting but it is a similar concept and we just that was just a random fact it's a little bit more complex for some inventions, especially something like fluorescent lighting. And I think this is a great point to just make, that sometimes the answer we're looking for is not going to be anything what we're expecting. When we're asking who was the person who invented the fluorescent light bulb, we actually have a history of development for it, yeah. not one sole creator. So if you're interested in that, as Dave mentioned, we do have a book available that you can borrow from the Windsor Public Library. Inventions and Inventors, there's two volumes. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that we had to dig through and get a text source. There was a lot of stuff online, but a lot of things that seemed to contradict each other. And this book really set us on the path to discover what the truth was. So there we are. Well, with that said, Dave, that's been a very illuminating episode uh, of fiction or nonfiction. So make sure that you visit WindsorPublicLibrary.com to get more great information and to perform research until then, I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And this has been Fiction or Nonfiction.